Welcome to episode 264 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak encouragement into the hearts of educators and get you informed and energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm talking with teacher Jennifer Brinkmeyer about cognitive load theory and how we can translate the research on cognitive loads to help students do more with less effort. Visit truthforteachers.com to get an easy to read, easy to share version of this podcast episode. I first started this podcast in 2015, and nearly 300 episodes later, I'm proud to say there's a wealth of helpful information available to you. But you don't have time to listen to 300 episodes. How do you know you didn't miss out on something great a while back? What if there's something you need to hear now that I haven't talked about in a while? Enter the new Truth For Teachers playlists. I've carefully curated the episodes I'm most proud of and that I think will help you the most from our seven years of podcasting. Choose from the Greatest Hits playlist, the Encouragement playlist, the Productivity playlist, and the Student Engagement playlist. Just go to truthforteachers.com forward slash playlists and enter your email address to receive the one that you want. I'll send you a PDF with a description of each episode, a link to its blog post, and a link to the MP3 file for listening. It also shares some special bonuses and other related resources I think you might like. I hope this helps you find the best of our Truth For Teachers podcast. Just go to truthforteachers.com forward slash playlists. I'm talking today with Jennifer Brinkmeyer, who's part of our Truth For Teachers Writers Collective. You might remember her from episode 230, in which she shared classroom meeting strategies and how class meetings are one of your most powerful tools for creating a respectful, inclusive class culture. Jennifer now has 15 years of experience and is working as a language arts teacher for English learners and an academic support specialist for grades 9 and 10 across the content areas. Her passion is building literacy supports that include all students. She's back now to talk about the research she's conducted on cognitive load theory and share how she's applied that work to help students get more accomplished with less effort. This conversation really prompted me to do a lot of personal self-reflection on my approach to teaching, and I hope it will do the same for you. So Jennifer, there are a lot of common misunderstandings about cognitive load. What is cognitive load theory in plain English, and how can it help us in our work with students? So cognitive load theory came from educational psychologists working with that idea of a computer as a metaphor for the brain. We've all had that experience where we got too many tabs open, there's too many programs running in the background, and your computer slows down and maybe even crashes. And so the thinking behind that is that our minds, when they're learning, are very much the same way, where if there are too many things going on, too many different loads happening, um, it can really inhibit our ability to retain learning for a long time. So in your article, you explain that there are three types of cognitive load, intrinsic, germane, and extraneous. What do we need to understand about managing each of these in our instruction? Yeah, so uh, I originally think that, uh, thought that you, you know, cognitive load was a bad thing. And the whole goal was to get rid of it because it, you know, made things too hard for kids. But really, there are these three types, and they're necessary to some some of them are to some extent. So intrinsic load is the inherent complexity of the content. So instructional design folks will say, you know, there's not much you can do to decrease it. It's just if people are working with something complicated, it's going to be complicated. Um, then there's the germane load, which is actually a type of load that is good to increase. Uh, mm. This is the load that you're using to understand and integrate content into your long-term memory, into schema. So if you don't have enough time spent manipulating that content, it's not going to get integrated. So that's actually a good type of load to have. And then the final type is the extraneous load, and that's the programs running in the background. This could be environmental distractions, It's also the internal distractions a child might come to school with. So maybe something that happened in the hall or at home or trauma or pain in the body 
um, any number of things that could be pulling focus and uh, that we may or may not be able to help students manage. Um, and then finally, redundancy of content. So um, if, so for example, if you're teaching about theme and you're working with ninth graders and you're teaching it like they've never heard of it before, they'll feel like it's pretty redundant because that's something they start introducing in elementary school and they'll, they, they'll just tune out before they even get to what's novel about it. Um, the brain just craves novelty and interest. And so if things are too redundant, um, or if students perceive that they're too redundant, they will tune it out. Interesting. Okay, let me re repeat back to you what I heard to make sure I'm understanding this right. So the three types of cognitive load, the first is intrinsic, and that has to do with how difficult the subject matter is. We can't always do something about that. Right. The second is um, germane cognitive load, which as a surprise to both you and me, that's actually a good kind of cognitive load. And that has to do with sort of uh, making these connections to other things that are germane or relevant to the topic. Yes. And then extraneous co cognitive load, which is extraneous or redundant information or um, you know, trauma, other things coming from outside that may be um, sort of pulling away our brain's resources so we can't concentrate on the task. Is that a good summary? Am I understanding correctly? Yep, that's it. Okay. So in the remainder of your article, you share the practices that you use cognitive load theory to help you manage your class time wisely and um, how you support students in learning. So talk to us about that, that first strategy, which you use for managing intrinsic load by reading or reviewing the information with a beginner's mind. So this is the version of cognitive load that we wanna try to minimize, which is the intrinsic, that um, inherent difficulty or complexity of the topic. What do you do for that? Yeah, so um, intrinsic load, you know, it's things are as complicated as they're going to be, but that doesn't mean we can't do anything about it. So beginner's mind is a Buddhist term about approaching things with fresh eyes um, mm -hmm. instead of loading them up with your expectations and preconceived notions. So in the classroom, this might look like, you know, say, let's say you've taught a text, you know, five or six times, you have maybe lost touch with what it's like to read that text for the first time and what is intrinsically difficult about that text. And this could happen in any content area. So I, I love approaching anything I teach with the beginner's mind because it helps me find what prior knowledge or connections I should be drawing upon, uh, what distinctions and misconceptions will need to be explored, and what meaning, what examples might help things click for students as well as just meaningful chunking and sequencing. Sometimes it's not a matter of, oh, oh, the students can't understand it. It's just, I need to get sign off on this part before I move on to this next part. You also share how we can manage the struggle of intrinsic load through considering the germane and extraneous loads too. And one of your tips is to slow down and interact more. Tell us about that. So the basic idea with computer models is that there's an input, there's a manipulation, and then it's integrated into long-term. Uh, we can't hold everything in short-term memory and neither can computers. They have to be able to integrate and store it for later. So the input is that finding those chunks um, in, in the intrinsic load, um, and that's what brings about the slowing down. So for example, if you have a short story, you don't have to read the whole thing in one day just because it's one short story. You can read a certain amount of it and help students understand the complexity of it before going on to later parts. Um, and that slowing down can give them the time they need to process um, and move on to some deeper manipulation. So the manipulations themselves, if, um, if you have considered the complexity of the text or the content, whatever it is you're working with, um, those manipulations should teach into those. So whatever's hard about it, don't shy away from it, don't erase it, but help students understand it. Um, so for example, maybe they're going to reflect and make connections to that prior knowledge. Maybe they're going to spend time exploring similar but distinct topics or work with examples. Um, in ELA, we do a lot of discussion and writing as our forms of manipulation of ideas um, uh, from text. Uh, but it could be a variety of interactive acti activities. Um, I know a lot of people do meaningful project-based learning or simulations, things of that nature. 
Um, and then finally, moving into integration, your formative and su summative assessment checks really are you checking to see, did um, integration happen? Did we get there? Um, and I have an example. Can I share an yeah, example? Yeah, I'd love that. Okay. So um, in the spring, I did a practicum with a kindergarten English learner group to add an ELL endorsement to my license. So I've been a high school teacher my whole career. So I was <laughs> in way new water. <laughs> um, and the, it was an opportunity to consider cognitive load. And I was working on this article at the time. Um, and so my teacher that I was in her room, she gave me a book. Um, and it's called Growing Vegetable Soup by Lois Ellert. And I could have focused on vegetables, um, the plant cycle or gardening, which are all related, but they're not the same. And so I really had to decide where I was going to, you know, plant my flag, so to say. Um, and I chose the plant cycle because there's some nice sequencing you can get into. And I was also tasked with focusing on vocabulary. So again, in thinking about the load there, uh, you know, for our input, um, I wanted to choose words that would extend through the study and endure, but also maybe words that students had maybe only heard of in one way before. So for example, water and plant, I tend to first think of those as nouns, uh, but the book uses them as verbs as well. And so uh, talking through like, so we water, we drink water, and then we water a plant. Um, and so that was some of the input complexity I had to help students navigate. You know, these are young, young learners and um, just beginning English. Um, for manipulation, um, we played with the words in a variety of ways. We worked with pictures. We did movements while we said the words. We looked for the words in the book and we read the book together. Um, but I also chose to not include some forms of manipulation. I found a really cute song. <laughs> you know I did. Elementary teachers know. <laughs> I found a cute song, but it had tons of extra language in it. Uh, and it would have been added way more extraneous detail than we needed for our target lesson and our, our target words. So then with integration, we ended with a formative assessment. It was in a familiar form that the students had practiced before. And I could see if the target words had made it into schema or it or if they would need more interaction and play before we could move on to maybe additional words within the plant cycle. I really like that example um, of slowing down and interacting more because, you know, when you were talking about that resource that you decided not to include because it would have had too much extraneous information, it would have, um, you know, been an additional cognitive load as students tried to sift through the information they actually needed and that, they, that information that they didn't need. I really related to that a lot because I think a lot of times as educators we're like, well, let's just give them as much as possible. You know, let's just throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. And maybe this kid needs this and this kid needs this. And, you know, sure, this is, you know, not totally necessary information, but somebody might find it interesting or it might, they might latch on to it. And I think especially when you're talking here about English language learners or young students, and in this case, both. Um, really being intentional about what information we're giving them to focus on and, and zeroing in on the intrinsic uh, cognitive load so that we're making sure that we're helping them make those connections, the germane cognitive load, and avoiding the extraneous cognitive load. You're sort of giving teachers permission to think about that a little bit more and be intentional with how much um, they share with yeah. students. So uh, really great thinking there. Um, another one of your tips is to do the same thing every day. Now, as you know, I am a huge proponent of finding things that work well for students and then repeating them over and over with slight variations, because not only is this less prep work for the teacher, but you're likely to get better learning outcomes because you're using strategies that you've already seen are effective with your class. And to the point of our conversation here, you're decreasing that amount of mental bandwidth that students have to expend on understanding what to do. And that's especially important when students have multiple teachers throughout the day. They have to remember every teacher's routines, that teacher's preferences, their expectations. That is a lot of cognitive load. And so when we can keep our own class structure similar from day to day, it really helps students move into autopilot so they're focusing on content and skills rather than on figuring out what they're supposed to be doing and what's expected of them. 
So your tip about doing the same thing every day, love it, really resonate with that. How does that fit with what you've learned about extraneous load? Oh, yeah. Well, there is just, no, just it's one of my least favorite feelings when I realize that I'm teaching an uh, assignment or task and not the content. Mm. When I realize like I am spinning my wheels trying to help the kids get what it is I want them to do and we're yeah. not actually engaging with the content. I'm just like, right. oh, I'm wasting <laughs> this time because it's short term, right? Like, I'm trying to load up their short-term memory just so they can get through whatever I'm saying and not what the actual learning is. Um, And so it's easy to think of intrinsic load as task or assignment load, but they're not the same. So like conducting research might be intrinsic load. It is an inherently difficult activity. Um, However, how my class is doing research or the steps I'm requiring, that is not part of the intrinsic load. So I have to ask myself, what parts of this are the content and what parts did I design just to get us through the unit? Because I thought that's what I needed to manage the group. And so my gut check is always thinking through germane manipulations and integrations. They feel authentic and natural um, as much as possible. So I know our students aren't um, running around doing tons of scholarly research, but they do have some authentic and natural tendencies for research um, that that can be leveraged then um, to help them approach how to conduct research without getting too far into the weeds with, well, you need to put your name up here and this thing goes over here and this should be color coded. No, Mm. nobody necessarily has to do it that way. Um, And the transfer is also not quite there. If they are so preoccupied with working on the assignment, they might miss the deep learning, which is the part you want them to be able to transfer, even if someone else wants them to research in a different format down the road. Yeah, that's such a great point because a lot of times we, we add those structures in, you know, like highlight this, capitalize this, put this over here, um, you know, in order to make things easier to grade Mm -hmm. for us in order to help keep students organized. Like there's lots of valid reasons, I think, for adding those in, but at the same time, trying to be mindful of the fact that, you know, if your students have, like all of us humans um, in 2020 do have a limited ability to concentrate and focus um, and and get things done. How, how, where do we want them to focus? Where do we want their energy to go toward, toward making sure that the right thing is the right color or really paying attention to the content and skills and trying to balance that out and just being mindful of how much we're asked, we're asking students to do. And I always go back to thinking about like how incredibly difficult it is to be a student you know, to be on someone else's schedule for six Mm -hmm. plus hours a day and told where to sit and when to stand and when to use the bathroom and when to work on this and to have so very little autonomy was extremely Mm -hmm. difficult for me as a student. I was not a good student for that reason until I got to college and I had the ability to make some of those choices. So I think about all that too when it comes down to the cognitive load and what we're asking of students to do. We can be easily frustrated by thinking, you know, these kids are just, they're not paying attention, but there's so much more that goes into it. And so much, I think, of what is demanding their attention and their focus is stuff that we aren't necessarily even aware of. It could be extraneous stuff, but it can also be things that are built right into the lesson that we don't realize are actually taxing our students mentally to such a degree. Yeah. I think, how can this be easy is a great question. Mm. I love that. How can this be easy? Why do we need to make things harder than they are? Life is hard enough, Yeah. right? How can this be easy? I love it. Okay. So if teachers want to apply some of what we've shared here to their work, you recommend starting with an informal extraneous load audit. What reflection questions can we ask ourselves in this audit? Yeah. So there are a few questions and it's, it's not personal or anything like, like use it as valuable information for you to figure out where you might want to decrease extraneous load. But Mm -hmm. one question is, um, how different is your class every day? Uh, Because that's both you and the students expending energy and time to figure figure it out. Um, How many different types of assignments are students being asked to do? Every new type represents new teaching for you and new learning for them. They need to be taught every assignment type. So I use an LMS in my district, so I've got kind of a template, and that's, so if we're doing a writing thing, it's always going to fall under this template, which is, makes it easy for me um, and makes it easy for them as they get to learn how, they, how we do things in, 
in my room or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, Another question I have is about the emotional tone of your class. How consistent is it? I know that we don't have absolute control because kids come in different days with their own own things going on. But just being aware of what you're projecting on a consistent, is it consistent? Mm-hmm. Or are, are students trying to track, you know, is, are we going to set, set him or her off today? Um, so just if you're feeling stressed and anxious, the kids may project that back to you. Wow. Okay. I have to stop you there because I think that's a big one right there. Yes. And, and I, we have emotions and we're entitled to our emotions, but it's good to be aware. Yes, absolutely. Especially if kids are coming from home environments that are unstable. Mm-hmm. You know, anyone who has grown up in an environment where they could not predict their caregiver's moods yeah. um, due to alcohol, drugs, mental illness, you know, even just stress, just, you know, regular day-to-day stuff, know how demanding that is on a child to try to process and anticipate that and how much cognitive load it takes up. So being mindful of not doing that in our classrooms is ouch. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a, that's a challenging one. I'm really glad you brought that up. (laughs) And and do what you need to do to, you know, provide that for yourself. Yeah. Um, But yeah, it is important. Um, Another is how messy or cluttered the room is. And Mm -hmm. this doesn't necessarily mean like messy, like there's coffee spilled everywhere, but, um, but also, you know, just a room that's full and stimulating can also be too much extraneous. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, different teachers manage this different ways. And I'm not trying to shame anyone for whatever their habits are. Um, But it is maybe worth it to find out, to ask students, especially students with ADHD, um, Mm -hmm. anxiety. And I've seen an increase in students with just um, with heightened sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that for me, a very full room almost feels noisy. Yes. Like the, the visual input reads as loud to me. Uh-huh. Um, and so uh, this can release you from some of the pressure to have the most like over-decorated classroom on the block um, and to just have a few simple things that students can focus on so it feels like a comfortable, inviting space uh, without there being just too much to look at. Yeah, it, it makes me really happy to see the trend toward over-decorated classrooms shifting over these last few years. We're moving towards more minimalistic, more aware of students who um, are overstimulated or have attention deficit disorder. Um, and I think this is such a great point that you made. An- another one to, to look at is a ra- ask a random sample of your class um, and see if they can explain a routine or procedure that you think is consistent. You think, oh, we do this all the time. I'm sure the kids know what it is. Mm-hmm. Now, there will be kids in the class who always seem to know what the heck is going on. And I bet you those kiddos come in with a smaller extraneous load. They have fewer mm-hmm. things to manage in the back of their mind. And that's why they know what's going on. Um, but a random sample may actually reveal what needs to be retaught and reinforced um, a little bit better. And then uh, another one I I think is worth asking is, you know, are students asking the same questions over and over? Um, Mm -hmm. And I think we've all experienced that where you're like, oh, I definitely didn't explain it well. (laughs) I guess here Mm -hmm. comes the same question. But um, it can also mean that some sort of load rebalancing is necessary. Mm -hmm. So maybe the content needs to be chunked differently. Maybe it's very clear that there have not been enough interactions to generate germane load. Um, or maybe there's some extraneous distraction that's totally, uh, you know, kind of getting in the way or some redundancy. So consider that if kids are asking the same questions over and over or not doing what they're supposed to or following directions, it, it's possible that one of the reasons why is not that you didn't explain it well, that they weren't listening or they didn't care. One possibility it could be that they had too many other things that they were trying to hold in their mind simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's something that you wish every teacher listening to this understood about cognitive load theory and its application to their work? Well, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about cognitive load with you. Um, And for me, it has major implications for literacy and language. All teachers are language teachers, and language is where a lot of cognitive load comes from. Right. We've got you've got your intrinsic load of your literacy standards and your English language proficiency standards that apply to all classes um, and need to be addressed. Then you have your germane load, which is 
the academic language it takes to just manipulate and integrate content. Um, and finally, you have that extraneous load, which is all the language that is either undertaught or the literacy needs that are under supported in the classroom. So students, you know, if you teacher saying something and they say a word you don't know, and maybe the word wasn't a big deal, but you didn't know it. And now you're, you're too busy thinking about that word and now you're missing the lesson. Um, I think, I think all of this is just laid in with implications. Um, and that's why I developed a literacy lesson plan um, that your listeners can get for free on my website. It's freedreading.com. Uh, when my entire school implemented this plan, we saw reading growth at double and triple the rates of our neighboring high schools. Wow. Um, and it's really hard to get growth in high school. Um, and this plan really does help with cognitive load significantly. Um, I have some exciting things coming soon for teachers who are using the plan. So I would love to get connected with anyone who's interested. Um, so that plan, it's four moves, literacy lesson plan. And it's on my homepage at www.freedreading.com.